So I'm going to talk about um, kind of what comes after uh, surgery. If if you're one of those families and patients that have had to have scoliosis surgery, what uh, what does that mean? And if I was giving this talk 30 years ago, I would say that would be a definitive branch point in your life. Your life would probably not be the same afterwards. You um, you would probably not be able to do gym class or sports after that. And, when, and a lot of those patients had to grow up and look for sedentary or desk type jobs. Uh, but nowadays I like to describe it as more of something that it's, it's a bump in the road. It may ruin your summer uh, or your spring or whenever you have your surgery, but it's not something that will uh, necessarily uh, change the trajectory of your life and the activities you do and and what you want to be and do when you grow up. Um, uh, so the, that's not to say there might not be some bumps in the road. So these are some papers, including from Dr. Wise's institution, that shows that even when you do have a, a, a fusion surgery, um, there's still a chance of needing other surgeries on your back at some point in your life. Um, and that's why it's important to continue to keep checking in with your doctor for a few years, maybe even up to five years after your surgery, just to make sure that there's no signs of problems with the bones healing or the rods breaking and things like that. Um, uh, because maybe even up to 13 to 18% of patients um, may need another surgery for one of those reasons. And, and here's some data from uh, this group, the HARM study group, that shows that um, even up to 10 years, 90% of patients have not had to have another surgery. Um, and the good news is, even if you do have to have another surgery, we've shown that um, once that pr problem is addressed, you can expect the same um, normal pain-free life uh, as somebody who has not had another surgery or a problem that's le led to another surgery. Um, so the vast majority of patients are pain-free indefinitely after their surgeries, uh, once they recover from the initial uh, time after surgery. Um, it should not limit your career choice and, the, and almost any sport that you want to play with some doctors uh, sometimes limiting a few sports like um, wrestling and rugby and tackle football. Uh, but for the most part, almost every sport is okay uh, to go back to once you've had a full recovery from your surgery. And the real big question I wanted to um, talk to everybody about is what's going to happen for those female patients long-term um, if and when the time comes to think about having their own babies. Um, and there's a lot of really important questions. Is there going to be enough room for my baby? Will the the rods and lack of motion uh, or limitation of motion um, uh, limit room for the baby or somehow affect the delivery process. Um, and what I can tell you is that it probably should not, uh, but unfortunately it, it still um, is affecting the way that women are treated in this country, in the United States. So this early study in the 1990s showed that there were some minor problems during pregnancy and delivery, uh, maybe a higher rate of vacuum extraction, um, and maybe the uh, episode, the severity and frequency of back pain in women that have had scoliosis and in particular fusion surgery for scoliosis um, maybe is higher, but um, uh, but it's hard to tell because that's a common finding in pregnancy as well. Um, and so uh, this group has has tried to answer some of these questions. We sent questionnaires to all of our um, subjects that we've been studying long term after a spine surgery for scoliosis. And we um, not only want to track them uh, it, as long as we can, decades after their surgery, but we want to find out how um, pregnancies uh, were for them, how the um, delivery process was. Um, and so, so we sent them a number of uh, questions, including some standardized questionnaires. Um, and here's what we found is that um, more than half of our our former subjects did not meet with um, th their anesthesiologist during the uh, pregnancy to talk about the plan for anesthesia during the um, labor and delivery. Um, and here's uh, just a diagram of some of the things that that may be considered for um, women that are um, in childbirth. And this is uh, an injection into the spinal fluid or an injection right next to the sac that has a spinal fluid, which is called an epidural injection, both of which can provide really good pain control uh, and still allow for a safe um, labor and delivery. Uh, and um, unfortunately, what we found is that um, the women that have had a spinal fusion in teen in their teenage years because of scoliosis seem to be getting a spinal or an epidural at a rate much lower than everybody else in this country. And we think that's not because they had scoliosis, it's because we haven't done a good job at 
teaching the obstetricians that it's okay for them to have spinals and epidurals um, because this is a different um, set of rods and implants than somebody who has them because of a fracture or because of arthritis or degenerative conditions in their lower back, which is closer to where the doctors like to put those spinals and epidurals. Um, almost everybody that has had scoliosis surgery should have room below where that um, uh, set of implants and that fusion is for uh, an anesthesiologist to put a spinal and epidural. Um, and so we are working, uh, we, we presented to the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists to try to educate them that this is so, an option that should be available to women that have had a scoliosis fusion, uh, but it's also we're educating our patients to be their own advocates. Um, and then one quick point, we asked, um, how is the baby doing for those women that have had a scoliosis fusion and a subsequent pregnancy? And all of the babies are doing great, except for one, which seems to be unrelated to um, the scoliosis surgery or um, anything going on in their spine. Uh, but here's what we try to um, educate our pa uh, patients about once they leave our practice and go into adulthood. Keep a copy of your x-rays, put it somewhere with all of your COVID vaccinations and other medical information. And ideally, that's going to be printed out on a piece of paper or a film or a CD. Um, and then you can um, show that to your obstetrician early in the pregnancy and say, hey, look, there's places here that you can put a spinal on epidural if that's something you want during that pregnancy and know exactly what your lowest level is so that you can have that conversation in an intelligent way with your obstetrician or more importantly, ask to see the anesthesiologist early in the pregnancy so you can have a plan with them as well. Um, and then ask your obstetrician if they've had experience dealing with uh, women that have had a scoliosis fusion um, and if they're comfortable with it and if they're going to tr um, um, try to change the plan during labor and delivery uh, because of your previous scoliosis surgery. Um, and then, uh, and these are just some talking points, kind of just asking those same questions that I just talked about. Um, and lastly, um, your scoliosis surgeon is also a resource. Their, your surgeon and their team should be a part of your life for the first um, five years or so after your surgery. Um, but we love to get updates and find out how you're doing even beyond that. Um, and if you're pregnant and having a hard time talking to your obstetrician about these sort of things, most AIS surgeons have relationships with obstetricians um, that, that know how to take care of women that have had these types of surgeries. And lastly, we, of course, love to, to find out how our patients are doing um, once they've gone off and grown up and, and doing great things. And we love baby pictures as well. Um, so um, please use your surgeons as a resource throughout your life.